Slowly but surely, we're coming back. How we doing, people? It's been a while, innit? I actually pod- recorded a podcast last week. I'd been going through quite a difficult time, man. Mentally, emotionally. Aye, uh, it's probably the closest I've ever been to a relapse in my recovery. If you've been following this channel for a while, you know. I'm in recovery. I've been clean for two years. And what a wonderful two years it's been. But in the small print, when you get off all the substances and you try and work on yourself as an individual, you work through all that kind of stuff that held you back. The small print doesn't tell you that it's going to be easy once you sort yourself out. You see, when you use drugs and alcohol, the way I did, I used it as a coping mechanism. I used it as an answer to all my problems. It was my solution. The thing is, when you use something as a solution for such a long period of your life, in fact, it's your only solution. Because see, up until that point, I never had a solution. When I first started using drink, drugs, alcohol. So when I finally found it, what I did think that I'd found was the thing. And it sounds kind of daft to say, but when when I first took drugs, I was always paranoid, right? Always paranoid about it because you always get a drug, don't you? Like, uh, drugs are bad, okay? It's just saying, oh, drugs will make you go do lally, this and that. And I, these things are true. But when I first took it, it was cocaine, eckies, whatever it was, I was like, this is amazing. This is dynamite. I love everybody. I feel good. I feel myself. See, I was always quite anxious. I can catastrophize where I think of the worst possible outcome in any scenario. I come across as confident. I am confident. I People talk about introverts, extroverts. I'd say I'm both. Times I can be loud and boisterous and uh, very good company. There's other times I can be inside myself. A bit homoerotic, I know. <laughs> but the thing is, when I took drugs, it was that answer. It made me feel at ease. It made me feel as if I could be myself. I was a laugh, I was accepted, and that first happened with me with drink. When the first time I drank, or one of the first times I drank, the first time that I drank that started off my drinking career. I remember drinking, and as I say, I always felt an odd one out, because I never drank, I never liked it. Uh, people were hanging about the shops to get booze, and I'm like, I want to go and play football, or do some stuff like that, and kick about. I remember days where the very odd occurrences where you'd boot with people, and they'd be trying to get a booze, and they'd be like, you know what, can't even get one, and no bother. And I'd be like, yes. I can have a normal day. I started drinking just to fit in, because that was always the odd one out that wasn't drinking. What are you not drinking for? What are you, what are you coming out for then? All that stuff. You suddenly became like a target of ridicule because you didn't drink. And for me, when I was younger, I always tried to fit in. I've always stood out, whether I liked it or no. When I went into secondary school, when you stand, when you stand out for what you could, you could deem as the wrong reasons, you don't stand out because you're a great athlete, you don't stand out because you're good looking, you don't stand out because you're popular, you stand out because you stand out. Because you're the tallest one, you, I was skinny, I was pure chalk white. And I used to get a slagging in school, and when I was in primary school, if anybody, I doubt anybody that watches this way at my primary, anybody that known, known me. Back then I was dead quiet, I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh cards, don't know if, if the young team are watching this, like Yu-Gi-Oh, it's kind of like Pokemon. Play mad cares and all. I re into that. I loved all that. Went into secondary school. That was out the window. I was planning to go into secondary school and play it. And people were like, you can't do that. No, no, you can't. You'll get slagged, mate. I remember somebody gave me that warning in primary seven. I was like, oh, what? I can't believe I'm going to play Yu Gi Oh! Secondary school. And obviously, you go into secondary school, you got a much larger peer group. You got a much larger audience. Suddenly, you're going through puberty. Suddenly you're interested in opposite sex or the same sex, depending on who you are. In my case, it was the opposite sex. And it still is. still is. Unlucky guys. <laughs> yes. But when I went into secondary, I it's just all changed. Suddenly it was so joyful and cheerful in primary and it just became serious. I didn't like it. And I always used to be... I used to race to get my work finished first. 
in primary school and that was my thing because I've always had a pure obsessive mindset Talk, people talk about addiction I've always been an addict I've always been addicted to something I've always found something that I, I liked and then just obsessed there maybe you could say I'm obsessive so that was my thing in primary but when I went into secondary school that made me the subject of ridicule or geek teacher's pet all that patter and suddenly when you're a target you're not used to it you don't like it so what you naturally gravitate towards is behaviours that will have you accepted by the pack. Be accept and I think you can go one or two ways, but for me, that's the direction I went. So I started acting out in class, started trying to get in the border in class, just lost attention in the studies and that kind of stuff. And I think that's a trait I've inhabited over the years where I've gone good at something and then I've just lost interest in it and given up on it. It's happened a couple of times. And then um, even the teachers and that going, like, what are you doing? What, what is happening here? And uh, I started being a class clown and I realised I found acceptance. People found me funny. They were laughing at what I was doing. They were laughing because of what I might do next. And suddenly I ceased to be the target. I was still uh, getting the attention, but it was, for my perspective, more positive. But as time went on, I, I, I wandered wandered through life is what I'll say because I just didn't really know where I fit in I would hang about with different friend groups I would alienate other ones and stuff like that because I was just trying to find somewhere I fit in I felt like a triangle trying to get into a square slot if that makes sense and then as time progressed I started hanging about with the local young teams uh, sensationalist media outlets oh have you think that they called us being groomed or indoctrinated into a gang or you, know, you just go and hang about with people of a similar age in your local area. Now and again, you get up to regular shenanigans. So that's what I'd done at first. And I still didn't really fit in there, but it was something. I had something. It was a sense of belonging, it was a purpose, it was something to work towards. I don't really know. I just knew that my ma was stressed out or nothing in the house. Money was tight. Don't get me wrong, I always had, I've never asked for come Christmas, come, I was never a deprived child, but times were tight. You know what I mean? Relationship with my dad wasn't he great. He was there, but he wasn't he. He was a father for a distance, is what I'd say. And obviously, there's his own stuff going on, and he's his own person in that respect. I've come to realise that. But uh, as time goes on, you're hanging about, you're getting taken home by the police for stu stupid stuff and you're pure buzzing to go in school and tell people and you know, all that, what? So you're just thinking it's this pure bravado thing. And as time goes on, like, behaviours that before seemed so abnormal, like drug taking, carrying weapons, gang fighting, before I ever like, hung about the scheme or the streets or anything like that, I was like, what? That seemed like pure, like, <laughs> top tier violence, top tier criminality to me. But when you're around it, it suddenly becomes normal. The abnormal becomes normal. And suddenly you're getting about it, like the gang fighting, and when I say gang fighting, it's no like the, you know, the cowboys versus the Indians, you know, I've taught of it. There's more like the bugs versus the ants. So you're running down throwing bricks and all that, and they're chasing you, you're, they're throwing bricks back. Odd times somebody maybe get caught and get a kicking. Native the odd occasion where it did get serious, where somebody got plugged or done in or murdered. I was never like involved or like run about anybody getting murdered, but I knew of occasions where people did get seriously injured. So the threat of violence was always there, and then you suddenly become sheltered and shut off for other communities. Because once you start hanging about a gang, you suddenly isolate yourself for going to the rival gang's territory because your face becomes known. So suddenly, you've got that street anxiety, that's what I like to call it, street anxiety, where when you're going to certain areas, or like if you're going in the bus, say, I talk to you, I hung about Hilton, or Penalty, these are two areas in the south side of Glasgow, they were the warring factions, is the terminology, and I'm using this terminology just to kind of make it make sense, right, I'm no trying to glamorise or sensationalise any of this stuff, which happens quite a lot, and it just really isn't the case. The reality doesn't reflect that, but 
for the avoidance of doubt, that's what I'll say. So you'd be going on the bus and going somewhere, and you'd be like, all right, I've got a few stops where I go by this area. And you'd be like, I hope I don't see any of that. I would be like that. I don't know, maybe people are a bit more game than me. I'm not afraid to admit, I just didn't, I didn't fancy my chances team-handed against me myself. I was never like that. I don't know if people watch my TikToks, whatever. I was never that person. I'm not that person. I'm not a violent individual. Have I got a capacity for violence? I'd say so. I'd say we all have that. I'd say more people off than not. If you push the right buttons, you'll get the wrong reaction, is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, as time goes on in that, and you're dwindling through school, and as I say, I didn't really apply myself. I still achieved decent enough results. But I had no direction in life. I had no idea where I wanted to go. There'd be the odd occasion where I would get into something, like, I go into boxing for a period, right? I watched Rocky and joined the boxing club, and that was the, uh, that was that obsessive mentality kicked in. Because see, whenever I would get obsessed about a certain well, thing like that, it's boxing in a sense, if I would get that bug for it, I would be like, all right, winning world titles, multi-millionaire. I, I would envisage myself at the, the height the height of success in that field. So I would work hard at that and I would be doing it, I'd be obsessed, that'd be all I'd be thinking about, it's all I'd want to talk about, it's all I would consume. And uh, people can say what they want, some people might go, oh, it's ADHD, oh, it's this, and I don't care what it is. In my opinion, it's positive. If it's a positive thing, I don't know, you could maybe get that bug for some illicit activities and it's no so positive, but in this case, it's positive. I'd say boxing's really positive. And then I'd say, I'd say it, and then over time, Look, I did not have the discipline in me at that time. I never understood. I never knew what discipline was. I didn't realise you had to work for years to get half decent at something. If you didn't lack that original talent, if you lacked that original talent, is what I mean. But I didn't know that. I was just my own kind of, my own coach, my own motiva- motivator. And I suppose we all are at some point. Plus as well, I was a bit too stubborn at the time, and that's still something I'm working through the now, but I would go in, I'd watch Mike Tyson, anybody watch his boxing, Mike Tyson, he's he's doing low, he's ducking under and that, but he's a very small heavyweight, so he would use his lacking height to his advantage, and duck under tall heavyweights from jabs, whereas I'm tall, so I'm sparring people that are smaller than me, and try to do all this Mike Tyson stuff, I'm getting cracked in the face, because I'm making it easy for them, so the club didn't really have any interest in what I was doing, who I was. Not so much who I was, but in terms of my ability as a boxer, they weren't, they weren't pushing it. So I just eventually lost interest in that after about a year and chucked that. But there was occasions, right, where I'm going back now, I was going to say back in my day. That's another thing I find myself saying. Back in my day. I'm 32 year old and I'm saying back in my day. I don't know if you But back in my day, right, there used to be a thing called PC DJ. Some people watching this might remember it, some people won't. So it was basically like a kind of, it was exactly PC DJing. You would uh, make up DJ songs from your uh, your PC. You would use programs. There was two quite prominent ones. There was Acid Pro and Mix Masters. So that was the music we all listened to back then. It was like Ned Techno. It was all these mad acapellas, looping there, looping and all that kind of stuff. Thinking back, it was ridiculous. It was piping. But it was, you loved it at the time. It was great. What kind of coincided with them, these types of tunes, was uh, the scheme disses. And they were PC DJ scheme disses. So it was like a kind of, like a techno tune or a trance tune or some mad tune and it had like people slagging each other at the top it and it would rhyme. And honestly, God, it's like, you look at these you get a big in two pack beefs, these rap disses, Nas, Jay Z, all that kind of stuff. This was his own thing. It was his own wee subculture where you'd get gangs that would slaughter each other. Helen and Penalty disses should have been in the charts, in my opinion. That was a point in school I can remember. Like when these disses came out, everybody was talking about it. And you would listen to it, and they'd be pure one liners, people getting slaughtered and all that. And part of me, part of it, me personally, I was like, I wish I was in that. This, I would, well, I would wish to be doing this, but at the same time, I wish it was me that was slagging, so I got a wee shout. So, uh, 
Aye, there was times where you'd, people would dabble in the PC DJing and then I'd say pals I was hanging about with, I'd end up in the house and they'd be like that. And the house and they'd make a wee tune and then you'd be sitting, and then you just knew what you were doing, but you were enjoying it. That's where I had my first taste of creativity. Tell a lie, why don't I had my first taste of creativity? When I was, I would say about nine, probably about that age, there was a thing that came out for the PS2, it was a webcam. So, you see, you get a webcam, it was a PS2 webcam, but it was part of a game, you'd buy the game and get the webcam with it, and you would play mad games with the webcam, it was, and you put it on top of your telly, you play your PlayStation, you play all these mad games, like, you could fruit flunk it, you'd knock it away, it's kind of similar to what you get with the VR games now, but it wasn't, it was just a webcam watching you, so, this was like pure groundbreaking technology, and me it was, so, what you could do in this webcam, you could record yourself, and I remember recording wee skits and all that, it was me and a pa- uh, Blair's pals at the time, Sean's name is, we were doing it, we'd make mad skits in that, and I remember what I made, and this kind of, this is almost like a kind of forecast into the type of person I was to become, this was almost like an, an omen. I remember I'd done one where I had a marble or something, it was some mad wee circle thing, and I was wearing this beautiful marble, it was filled with the uh, purest of cocaine and that, as if I was a salesman, and then I would kid on it, I accidentally drop the marble, I thought, oh, I've dropped the marble, it's burst everywhere, and then I'd get, I'll need to pick it up, and I'd go down and I'd go, oh yeah, and that, as if I was sniffing it, because it's the stuff I'd watched in daily, right? I remember showing it to his dad, he was pure howling. I didn't really know anything about it, I just knew people sniffed cocaine. I'd seen it on TV and that kind of stuff, so I found it funny. So that was my first kind of taste into creativity. And performing as well, there's a, a Billy Connolly parody. It's about George Michael, and George Michael got arrested for that kind of fracking uh, toilet with the police. It's uh, to, the, to the tune of, if you got to have faith, is you had to masturbate, debate, debate, you had to masturbate. So I found a tape, right? So, I'm saying it again, back in my day, back in our day maybe, depends who's watching, we uh, used to get like, tapes, and you would put it in a tape player, and it was like a small VHS, it, was, it wasn't a VHS tape, but it was like a tape, I, I don't know how else to describe a tape, it was a cassette, if you don't know what that is, then Google it, you're too young, but ask your dad. So uh, it was a tape, right, and you would record random stuff at it, so you would go into a cupboard and find random tapes, you don't know what was on it, you play it, and blah, what's that? Nothing like the day, right, you would just find random stuff, so I found this Billy Connolly tune, I was like, what is that? And I memorised it, word for word, I remember I sang it once, in front of my, my, uh, Sean's mom and they were pure howling, no, I didn't really know what I was talking about, they would get us and shout us in the living room, and all like, you're going to do that tune for them, and all that, and they'd all be laughing. I didn't really know what I was singing about, so that was where I had the kind of first performance thing explored. But it was wasn't it something that I was I felt I could pursue, and that there was never a conscious thought of oh I could maybe go and elaborate on this. That was never the end of my my realm of thinking. So fast forward the PC DJ and stuff, you would dabble in it in friends' houses and that, and I'd, blah, I'd love it. Blah, I'm tuned right in it. That obsessive mindset was there, but. You would obviously need to leave their house eventually. That's a few times I basically get papped at their house because I'd be trying to stay just on their computer. And uh, my mom didn't have a PC. We didn't have a PC or anything like that. So I couldn't really explore it back in the house. So, <clears throat> sad to say it, right? Sounds bad. I was a ch- young boy then. I-, I would purposely hang about with people that had this kind of stuff in their gaff. And I'd be like, I'm going to go back to yours. I'm going to sit in yours and all that. So I could go on it. Just because I-, I loved it. And there was times where I remember there was a period I was, I was hanging about with a boy and he had it and we'd be making tunes together and all that. And uh, I made a tune and I remember like, the wee mob started listening. They didn't know it was me and they were all listening to this tune. I was like, no danger, I've made that. And they didn't actually believe it and I was feeling chuffed. I was like, no way, we all listen to my tune. <laughs> and, uh, I, and of course, I uh, also ventured into the dissing world. I was pals with a boy and uh, we were wanting to make a diss, so like, I need to make a diss about something, you can make a diss about. And we pick, we could have picked the boy's name out of hat. His name was Johnny, he stayed up the stairs with me, random boy, nice guy, done nothing to deserve it, and we like, diss him. Just pick, honestly, God, it was just so right, it was like the first name that came out of our heads and we just went, aye. And uh, it was, it wasn't even for that, we dissed him because we didn't like him, we dissed him because we wanted somebody to make a diss about. 
But it wasn't like we were pure. We were wanting the world to hear it, we were just doing it for the sake of doing it. So we made like three disses, they were terrible, they were honestly so bad, they were pure squeaky voice, shocking. And uh, the school ended up getting windy and get suspended in second year, get a 10 day suspension for it. I, I had to go up and apologise to him and all that. And uh, I, so anybody that knows the kind of work I do, it's like the dissing has been in me for young. But as I say, these were just daft wee, I don't know, explorations into creativity. But I didn't realise it was creativity, it was just, I think you done what you enjoyed. <coughs> then fast forward, hanging about the streets, I was in school and I didn't really know what I was going to do when I left school and it was like, oh, you were, see school for me, I feel as if you were just Sorry. being bred to be a bootlicker. I turn up for an interview early, but don't turn up too early, mate. I mean, give yourself a wee half cup before it. Oh, by the way, you can apply for 50 jobs, no hear back for one, or oh, this day, this, and all that. And I'm like, what? This is for a job in Sainsbury's, you kidding us on? And I'm not saying anything about people who work in supermarkets, but come on, man. It's like, where's the encouragement for yourself worth in these places? But be grateful somebody wants you to stack their shelves. Man, fuck them and their shelves, pricks. But anyway, I had no idea what I had to do, and it was like, would you, would I ask you, like, uh, you get a careers advisor? Like, I mean, I don't know what I want to do. Like, none of that shit interests me. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to go there. I don't know. And uh, they suggested some jobs to me, and I think plumber. And I think it was just, I don't know if it was the syllables and the word plumber. I don't know if it was maybe the first one they suggested. I was a plumber. Could maybe do that. So I had no idea how to, how to go about applying for this. So I remember I grabbed a, a yellow pages one night and just started phoning cunts. And I mean, I was phoning people that are, what, had their numbers on call and all that. People in the pub like, what is it? And I'm like, are you looking for apprentices? Like, no, Bolt, don't phone me again. And then, uh, so I didn't even really, I don't think I had any support now to even look for a job that I didn't want to do. <clears throat> so for me, I don't think, school wasn't really designed for people with me. I like drama. I really like drama, but... I was in that mindset of what, what caring what people thought. So it was something I was quite embarrassed to try and pursue and that kind of thing. And as I say, I was I wouldn't ever say I was the most badly behaved, right? The head of drama, her name was Mrs. Kirkwood. She was a wee fat old looking woman. She hated me. Just hated me. It's one of the ones man I could have breathed and she'd have packed us out of class. So the fact we all, that just kind of put me off as well. So I was in a lot of collision with authority figures. But I realised I've, I've had a lot of issues with authority figures in my life, and I think that stems from my mum. My mum was just dead overprotective, but it doesn't come across that way when you're younger. You're just seeing you're getting told what to do. Getting told what to do, and you don't agree with it. When you go to school, you get teachers telling you what to do, then punishing you for no f getting told what to do. And then you're like, I don't want to listen to any. And as you're starting to grow into your own person, that's, that's healthy. You know what I mean? Because you're, <clears throat> you're consciously deciding for yourself. You're not a robot. You're not programmed to follow instructions. You're programmed to think consciously, which you should. So, eventually I left school. I got invited to leave. And uh, I just went and hung about the streets. Just kicked about. And I just saw that as freedom because I was like, no, you can't tell me what today. I don't need to go to school, don't need to do nothing. And <clears throat> that was it. And that lasted for a grand total of a year before, lo and behold, I got myself four and a half year for a serious assault, which was an attempted murder that got reduced. I was carrying knives. I was never a violent person, but I never had that that self belief. Well, that's that respect. What I, I wanted respect. I wanted, I know what I wanted respect, I just wanted to be seen as an equal. I didn't feel as if I was seen as an equal. I felt as if carrying a blade, that I was given that respect. And it wasn't a case of... I was respected because I would use it, it was respected just because I had it. Oh, he's got a blade, carrying a blade. And that we are. That's it. So it was just, it was... And I talk about this recently in media forums where I say it was, it was kind of like a comfort blanket. I felt comfortable. I didn't have that street anxiety anywhere because I felt as if... If I'm outnumbered, I've got backup, essentially. But it's like, if you're caring about something, if you've got a packet of sweeties in your pocket and you're hungry, you're not going to wait till you get home, are you? You want to sweeties first. You end up in a fight and you've got a blade on you. 
in a moment of anger, you pull that blade out and punch somebody. Just the way it goes. Trust me, I've done enough jail sentences. I've met multiple people that you're looking at and you're like, ah. <clears throat> it was just the wrong place, wrong time for you, wasn't it? And I could probably be the same, but if you're cutting about carrying a blade and you're hanging about schemes, you're in all these kind of these situations, then you're kind of you're no exact, you're cutting your odds. You know what I mean? If something no happening. So eventually it happened, I've went into this previously, my time in prison and all that, it's not really relative to what I'm actually talking about here, but as I say, it's like, I never never had much direction in life, and I think that's what people need is direction, and you need encouragement that it's not a case of whoever you're speaking to, look, if you're an authority figure, if you're a parent, I'm not trying to tell you how to raise your brains, but if you ask them what they want to do with their life, and they tell you what they want to do with their life, don't shoot them down. Don't say, ah, well, ah, but it's not very likely, you know that. <clears throat> Nothing's likely until somebody does it. Especially these days, people are constantly surprising you. So don't be that negative person that shoots somebody down because you don't believe in it. You know what I mean? So, the thing is, the position I'm in the now, that is all came from me being in the jail. I discovered the guitar. This guitar, I found that in Pullman, and I've never let it go since I got it. That has done three jail sentences with me. Oh, I mean, that's been my co-pilot many a time. That has got me through some hard times, even up to recently. <clears throat> I found that in the jail. This led me on to posting videos on Facebook, which led me on to doing my own podcast, which led me on to acting in series and short films, which led me on to mainstream TV, which led me on to national tabloids, which led me on to starting my production company, which led me on to running my own business, which led me on to being self-employed, which led me on to having a studio. I mean, the origins weren't exactly the most positive, but the outcome, come on. I don't like to blow smoke up my own ass, but come on, I've done all right. And that's what I was just saying to myself, I was set, this took me like 45 minutes to set up because I've got quite a, quite a decent set up. Now compared to, I started with a GoPro, it wasn't even mine, it was Matt, shout out Matt. And it led on to iPhones, and I used iPhones for the majority of the time. Now I've got two cameras, and it's four years later, and I've got this five hundred quid light setup. You can see it; you can see the quality. You know what I mean, it's improved. And uh, <clears throat> as I was setting up, I was getting a bit resentful. <laughs> so I'm just came back from my home group there, and uh, I was kind of like, oh, I "Could just chill, man." Kick back, just relax. But I'm actually acting the more. Uh, I'm acting in a short film playing a CID. So I've got a small window the more to film and edit this to upload it. Because I want to, I want to speak and want to speak. And then I reminded myself that people would cut one of their testicles off to be in a position where they can set up and record a podcast in their house. I've got a full studio set up here. I can do whatever. I can make a tune, I can make a podcast. I can film it. <gasps> Pardon me. I've got the podcast set up. Look, people pay hundreds of pounds just to get an hour in a studio. And I've had a studio before. And I've been in positions before where I remember. <clears throat> Sitting in my room demented. Like, ah, what should you say the studio? I could just get up and create and do something. I've got it. What we're all guilty of, though, is becoming complacent. Because see your dreams that you're pursuing, whatever that may be, whether it's a wage rise, whether it's a, a promotion, whether it's a house, a car, once you get it, it's good. Then you get used to it. No matter what it is, you're a multi-millionaire and you get a big house, you'll get used to that house. And then you become complacent. 
sometimes you just need to stop and look back at where you've came from and be grateful for it, man. Gratitude is the attitude. And being able to practice gratitude in my life, you might, some, there's people who's looking at my life like, ah, that is my dream life. This is my dream life. I need to remind myself of that. I mean, there's people look on the outside looking in, you might be watching this now, like, ah, he's got it, man. He's got it, and I have. I have, and I've worked very, very hard for it. The thing is, see, when I talk about these times where I became obsessed about something, and I've worked hard at it, and then I've lost interest, and it's faded away, I used to think about that all the time. All the time, I would think, but like, where would that be now if I just stuck at that? And it was a couple of times that happened, boxing, been winning. With that attitude, that stayed fresh in my mind, that feeling. And I've applied that to this. Don't get me wrong, there is periods where the motivation does fluctuate. There's less motivation than there is motivation. Motivation comes and goes. I've learned that. That's where I learned the importance of discipline. Showing up, being consistent. Doing it when you can't be asked, finding the time to do it. Because uh, see if you get caught up in how many obstacles you've got, that's all you think about. Think about obstacles, you'll get obstacles. Think about solutions and opportunity, you'll get them. And I've, this is a, a, fixing, a fix it whilst you're moving type method. Because I used to look at people and think, right, once you learn it, it's learned. It's not like that. It's like, it's a tricky character. It'll catch you, and, it's, and that's my experience. I've been caught out quite a lot. But the uh, thing is, I keep coming back, keep returning to the dance floor. Because I love it, man. I love talking to yous behind the camera, on the telly, Spotify, whatever it is, man. Because, as I say, I get caught up in the thinking, it's been four years now. I've been doing this four years, surely. I get this, get this. What do you expect? There's no a guy that's sitting at a finish line with a calendar going like, oh, it's been four years now. Here's a million quid or here's a hundred thousand subscribers or here's a half thousand views a week. There's no like that. You know what I mean? This is a, it's a long game. But what I've realised now, this has been a journey for me and if you've been watching for the start, it's been a journey for you and all. The question I need to ask is, what can I give? So what can I get? What can I give? And I've only just re realised that recently. What can I give? And when I done the ayahuasca, I had a moment where I was purging and I kept wiping my tongue and I was like, ah, and I was like, I was drinking water and I was washing my mouth out with the water. And the, the message I got for that was, be careful of what you say. Don't talk shit, essentially. Because people are listening. It might sound daft, looking at my subscribers, or I don't know how you view me. Some people might class me as a public figure, so other people's definitions are welcome to it. Only recently I became aware of like, how many people actually listen to what I say. When you're for the scheme, and when you're no used to being heard, because even you're for the scheme, you're working class, you're no used to people listening to you. So, it's quite a thing to get used to. And to be honest, I have an awareness of it, but at the same time, I just be myself. This is all a learned thing, and it's a, a thing, it's a process. It's a beautiful one as well, man. It kind of feels like a Truman Show to a degree, but in the sense where there's people who's watched my journey for the start, they've watched me grow through it, because I went through addiction, I've went through jail, all whilst interacting and engaging with social media, with podcasts. You watch through these podcasts, you'll get back to the start, and you'll get a lot, lot of me, a lot of what I'm going through at the time. And uh, that's just the way it comes out. It's natural. I don't try and put up this character. I don't try and put up this front. I don't try and put up this facade. Just be me. And uh, if I can encourage you to do anything in your life, be yourself. You don't need to think about it. It doesn't take hard work to be yourself. You know what I mean? And if you're looking for adoration, you'll get it. You'll get it from the right people. 
and the wrong people for you. They'll ease themselves out. You shut the door behind them, trust me. So the way it is now, I look at a lot of young people, for the scheme especially, and when I was younger, the same problems are mirrored, probably even made worse. Like we've all got this access to each other, but nobody really has a voice. Nobody's listening. And some people might be watching this going like that. Hypocrite. I messaged you and you didn't reply back. I don't keep in touch my messages as well as I should. Should I? Is there a, an obligation when you start releasing content that you need to reply back to every single message you get? I get a lot of messages. And a lot of the time, life is a juggling act. Sometimes I did wrap them. Dropped them last week. It's going through a bit of... I was situation with my girlfriend, all self-inflicted by myself. And uh, I realised the power of communication. And actually talking about how you feel. And talking about problems when they happen. And uh, action, but that's the thing as well. It's like before I would retreat. When I was uh, going through an uncomfortable period or whatever. But now I lean into it. Because see the thing you feel most uncomfortable with then, and I'm not talking about anything that goes against your morals as such, usually the stuff that makes you feel most uncomfortable is where you feel the most growth. We growth. I pray, right? I'm not afraid to admit that. I pray in the morning. I used to pray for growth. And I used to think I would just suddenly wake up and I would just deal with scenarios and instances with a newfound method. It would just appear in my life and then my old way of thinking would disappear. You see, it doesn't work like that. What will happen is you get challenges and obstacles flung your way and you need to navigate them in a manner which is conducive to growth. See, growth feels uncomfortable. If I've said this before, I apologise, but I'll repeat it whilst we're on the subject. If you go to the gym, right, whoever's been to the gym here, remember your first day at the gym, you went and done biceps or done a bit of benching, done some weights, maybe jumped in the treadmill. How did you feel the next day? Your muscles were in agony, right? Pro that, what a robocop. You were in pain. You were in pain when you were doing the weights and you were in pain the next few days after it. So that's what I called delayed onset muscle soreness. It's called the DOMS. But with that, you either went one or two ways. You either retreated and said, oh, no doing that, or you went back. What you find is, when you're in the gym, you're working out, let's use bodybuilding, for example, you're lifting weights, you're feeling pain during the process of that workout. With your muscles do, they're accustomed to the weights you're lifting. They get stronger, they get bigger to accommodate the resistance they're under. Yeah. So what do you do? You don't stay at the same weight because then you plateau. You want to see any further gains. You increase the weight. You increase the demand in your muscles, the resistance, in order to accelerate further growth. Yeah. That's what life does. You see, when you get presented with a scenario, it tests your patience, it tests your resolve, it tests your discipline, and you work to overcome it. You learn something about how to deal with that particular situation and yourself, build self-confidence. For one, you maybe learn skills like the likes. <laughs> Since I've been doing this podcast, this has been a regular occurrence. And at the start, I just felt the universe was against me, that it was a sign that somehow I wasn't at a day podcast because it would have been easier. If I was today podcasting, it would have been easier. That's what I used to think. Now I've realised these tests are happening to me because it's making me the best podcaster I can ever be, the best editor, the best producer. Because I'm figuring out all the ways it can go wrong. And when it does go wrong, I know how to solve it. I'm becoming a very great problem solver. I'm reframing my perspective on that. And that's what will happen. See, because I've become a decent problem solver and I've solved all these problems, that doesn't mean there's no more problems that's going to happen. It means there's going to be more problems that can't happen and I'm not going to know how to deal with them until they happen. 
I'm not going to anticipate half of them. That's growth. And it can happen in relationships, passions, career-wise, you name it. To some people it might sound daunting, but remember, with growth, you grow towards your higher self, you become better, you iron out all the stuff that's holding you back, or you can retreat. But where are you going back to? What are you going back to? Because you think you're running away from a challenge, you're running away from difficulty. But what lies on the other side of that difficulty? Your dreams, man. So remember that when life gets difficult, and it will get difficult, try and stop yourself and remind yourself of that in the moment. It's tough. I'm not going to sit here and say I do it all the time. I try and do it. But sometimes when times are difficult, just go, ah, why is this happening? Right, what's going on here? Somebody's got a grievance with me up there. You can take it personally, but it's no personal. It's personal development. So the likes of the position I'm in the now, and another thing I've got reviews, the subscribers and all that, right? There's people that watch this stuff that listen to what I'm saying. I'm in a very powerful position because... I've got a lot of life experience. I'm not a social worker. I've not grew up in the West End. I've no my mom and dad were not the girl when I was growing up. I've not been to uni. I've not done any of that. And if you have, good on you. I'm not taking any away for you. But I feel I've got a lot more rela relatability to offer people who come from a similar background to me. You're not paralysed in your past. But the likes of me, see most people that go to jail that go into success. For what I've seen, they usually go in to sell drugs and they wear like that until they get to jail again. That seems to be the success story for what we used to see. And I'm no bumming myself up here, right? But for the stuff I've done, for the mindset I've had, for what I've been through and what I've put myself through, I feel I've managed to edge it in my favour quite well. I would say I managed to chip the goalkeeper. Listen... I've still got a full 90 minutes to play, but I'm doing all right. You know what I mean? So, I really want to work with people in communities and that and just encourage them. Encourage yourself. Listen, don't isolate yourself with what I'm saying. Go, all right, he's talking to people who's mom and dad's on together or I've been to uni, I can't be talking to me. I'm talking to you. The only requirement for me to be speaking to you is for you to be listening. Simple as that. That's it. That's the terms of entry. Take it or leave it. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not selling anything here. This costs nothing. It costs me my time and I'm gladly offer you it. When I say my time, is it my time? Who does time belong to? You <laughs> know what I mean? It's like, I'm privileged I can sit here and do this. This is doing a lot for me. Is this doing anything for you? I don't know. But it might. The thing is, I'd always get hung up. Look at, oh, 10,000 views, 100,000 views. I only got 1,000 views. How many lives do you change, change, mate? I mean, what is the value of a human life if you've somehow helped alter the trajectory of somebody's path? steered them away for something negative or just giving them trajectory or giving them the inspiration to think about it have you any way attributed to somebody's path in life one person one person's a success never mind the views you know what I mean if anybody's taking any away for this take it for me man you can pursue your dreams and they, they can stop you. Simple as that. You know what I mean? End of the day, life's going to be difficult. I've worked in building sites, I've worked in cleaning jobs, I've worked in sales jobs. I hated them all. There was that brief thing, I would always get a job when I needed a job. I wasn't one of these people who would be like, all right, I always had a job. I would usually get into a job because I'm skint, either I would do debt or I'd no money, and there'd be a wee 
Right, you go to Job or you get some agency work, you're at Mora, but uh, right, yeah, it's good stuff. And there would never be this elation. Well, yes, I've got a job, but uh, right, I've got the booze away from the door. It was kind of like, uh, right, I can kind of get a bit of breathing space. But within about a week, two weeks, I'd be fed up. i get complacent quite quickly. Obviously, gratitude, my attitude wasn't in the right place at the time. But at the same time as well, it was just never for me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just... For me, I've, I've got a lot more awful life where I'm other now. And I like to think I'm off on it. I've got a lot more to offer, but I, I'm on a journey, man. I still need to figure it out. I'm still figuring myself out. I think as I try and be raw and honest about where I'm at, right now, I feel amazing. Last week, <laughs> the opposite. As I say, I was close to relapsing. It was like, I say close to relapsing, I wasn't planning doing anything, but Sometimes like, the thought of like, using would come into my mind. And it does happen. It's a fleeting thought. It doesn't usually... It's like passes you like a bus in the street. See, you're standing at a bus stop and the bus is full and it flies by you. It's kind of like that. It comes and goes before you think about it. But I, the past week, it was kind of... It hung about a bit too long. Well, I mean, long enough for me to get the fear. How times have changed. For the better, but... But, uh, obviously, I worked through whatever issues I had at the time. And uh, I feel much better for it. And my relationships are better. My life is better. And I, but that was a bit of difficulty I had to navigate. And in na navigating that difficulty, I've learned a lot about myself and a lot about the situations as well. And one of the things as well, it's like, when I done ayahuasca, they ask you, what is it do you want to improve your life? And I said, Relationships. I take you back, that's what I always done. I always jumped from group to group, from pal to pal. So I'd never felt settled anywhere. And I thought it was people with daft stuff. And uh, when I came back for the ayahuasca, I thought I was going to be this super amazing person that was just had others of pals and yeah. all this kind of stuff. My relationships are amazing. No, I came back and I got a lot of tests flung my way and I had to navigate them. In times it could have went either way, but I'm at the point now, my relationships are better than ever. And I'm realising the power of human connection. Connect, reach out, don't isolate yourself. We live in such an isolated society these days. We have so much access to each other, but we are more isolated than ever. Which is very, very strange. It's a strange period we find ourselves in, but I would encourage it. Connect, man. Listen, I know I say I'm no great with messages, man, but reach out. If you're needing any advice or fucking struggling, man, I know what it's like. You may be watching this. Some people develop a relationship with me, but just watching it, I know that feeling. So, I might not know you personally, but listen, I might not know you as the person, but I might know what you're going through. Never underestimate the power, really, a Billy. I mean, we're all going through some stuff, man. And, uh, is it a problem shared? Is it a problem halved? But I encourage you, man, life's too short. And I'm not saying bin everything and go running down the yellow brick road, but if you like something, do it. As I say, see, I've been self-employed, working for myself for the past seven months. I hate calling it work. Work is a dirty word. Oh, I've got work the morning. Work? Ugh. No work. It's beautiful. It's like, Sometimes I get caught, I'm like, oh, I've got this today, I've got that today, and I'm like, great. Well, I mean, I get to the choice of going out and working with people. And I'm out filming skits for people. I'm like, ah, right, here's a funny idea, let's do this, you act this and you act that. And I'm like, this is my job. And sometimes it's the great, the best job in the world. I get to make daft content for people, and people love it. And then I get to sit in the house and edit it. I get to work for him, I get to have my coffee, I get to put my heating on, especially when it's freezing. It's ice, it's a miraculous thing. <sighs> oh, it's late. It's, uh, the hour's getting long, but I'm enjoying talking. And I hope you're enjoying it today. Whether you're connected with what I'm saying, or maybe you just enjoy me talking in the background. Better than a legs in it. All I do is argue with them, man. It's where I'm getting done with a domestic. But I was actually coming on to talk about overcrowding in jails in World War Three. I was in STV just the other day, 
and uh, they wanted me on to talk about overcrowding in jails and now I'm just becoming that go-to guy that talks about being in the jail and uh, I'm listen see if you know me it's, I, I don't talk about jail all the time I I don't stray away from it if it's relevant to the context of the conversation but because I can kind of articulate myself I'm a talker I'm on social media I've got a bit of a public platform and I've been in jail and I'm reformed so to speak, because I, I say so to speak, just reform, this is a mad term. People go to me and ask me my opinion on certain things. And I overcrowding in the jail, it's like overcrowding was a problem when I was in jail when I was 17. Still a problem now. It's clearly whoever's in charge of these decisions isn't they figuring out the difficulty. You know what I mean? This problem's still reoccurring. I think they've got some growth to work on right here. That uh I think people that are in a jail are just lost, man. You know what I mean? It's like, I was lost and I found myself in jail. You leave people up to their own devices, depending on their environment. If you come for a scheme, you're left to your own devices, you're lost, you don't get much direction or guidance. You're, you're going to fall into the trap. You know what I mean? You're going to fall into the hole, in my opinion. I think more people fall into the hole than don't. Because you hear the people, oh, he came for the scheme, working class back, and he's done so well. I... You hear about them, but what about the people you don't hear about? You don't hear about the not-so-successful stories. <coughs> and there's a lot of them, there's a lot more. It's great to hear a success story, I don't take that away from Andy, but it's the stories we don't hear. You know what I mean? Which is the reality for a lot of people. Because you just feel that is your reality. This is who I am, and this is how I should behave. You're going to treat me like that, you're going to class me as that. Sound... I'll just do so. I've done it myself. So, what I'm realising now, before, I'll be honest, see, the start of this journey, I'll, keep, I'll call it a journey because that's what it's been, right? It was all fame and fortune. Don't get me wrong, that still strays into my mind now and again, but I, I was waking up in the morning and I was like, I want it, I want it now and I want it the morrow. It's like, it's a journey to get you need to become a certain type of person to acquire that type of life, and now, as much I welcome it, it's not my immediate focus. So I'm thinking, what can I do with fame and fortune? I could do a few things in my life, but I'd probably get used to it. Get used to the money and that after a while. That's why all these mad billionaires and millionaires do the maddest of stuff. Because... After a while, you get used to it, so you start making these extravagant purchases. Uh, Conor McGregor obviously has got a bit of heat in the headlines lately. I don't really want to go into that because I don't really know what the truth is, but if it's true, wrong in. And if it's not true, unlucky. But the thing is, well, he's a mad raging gear. He'd look at his lifestyle and he's probably got all the money in the world. It's like, how, mu how much is enough? After a while, you'd probably just get used to it, and it does look great. When you're in a, working a 95 job, and you're working wage to wage, and you see somebody in a Lamborghini yacht, aye, we'd all take it. But I'm realising the position, and I'm in a position now, I've had more money than I've ever had in my life. I'm not rich by any means, but I've got good money coming in, and I've got money sitting there, which I'm never used to having. I'm used to working wage to wage, so I'm in a comfortable position financially. But I'm realising, like, I'll talk about this, right, and before I do this, the only reason I mention this, right, is the context of the money. I'm I'm looking at this money I've got, right, and something in me just, it doesn't fit, it's just I'm like, ah, what can I actually do with this? I know there's a lot of things you can buy, but what will it give me inside? I just, I was at Lidl the other week, yeah, and then there was this woman, she was begging outside it. And I always say to them, listen, do you want to end out of here and that? And they'll go, aye, a juice, a sandwich, whatever. So, says to her, do you want to end? And she's like, aye, aye. She basically gives me a, a, a shopping list. Laundry detergent. <laughs> she's diluting juice, bowls of water for the diluting juice, a lasagna, gall I suggested garlic bread, eh, a biscuit for a boy, all that stuff, right? And I was like, aye, fine. I'm like, I look asked. So I'm not going to knock you back. So I went and got it. And uh, 
I had like a, a score in my pocket, and I was kind of like, oh, I'm not going to get a score and all of that. I was like, I saw the really change. I think I did some change as well, but like, I get a score, and I was like, ah, getting a mess, you know what I mean? So I was going in for a, I can't remember, a loaf of bread or some, uh, but I wasn't was getting for much. And uh, you're out talking to her, and she was an addict, and she'd tell me how she'd been abused and all that kind of stuff, or her ex tried to kill her and all that, he's out in bail, and then she's doing there, she's, she's for Clyde Bank. But she's staying in Govan because she's in a woman's refuge and all that, and she's got a boy there that's, you know, this fucking carnage. And uh, these two guys have come up. They've got addicts and all, and she was telling me about one of them. She says, oh, a guy's going to give me a phone and all that. Cause I've not got a phone, but I don't know what he's wanting in return for it and all that. I think he's wanting something that I'm not want to give him kind of thing, or kind of something, a kind of like a, a sexual favour, essentially, is what she was saying. So they, these two guys have turned up. And they're kind of hanging about like, they were dead nice to me, and dead nice, oh, I'll go get you a cup of coffee and all that, and they're talking. But then I noticed they kept, look, like, they were muttering away at each other, they were kind of like, see that way as if they've just seen the post, they were talking away, dead quiet whispers and all I'm like, what's going on here? And I, I didn't like my gut feeling, I just didn't like the vibe of it. And then she says, look, that's one of the guys. So, eventually they're hanging about a couple of minutes, and then like, oh, listen, we're going to see so-and-so, this guy, We'll come back and see you then when we come back, all that, and they went away. And she's like, ah, aye, she's like, they didn't like it that you were here. And I'm like, ah, right. And I just was like, ah, right, what do I do here? Because I don't want her to be here when they come back, because I don't want to leave her in case they come back and something does, because my gut was telling me I don't like these guys. Or no, I don't like them, I just didn't like how my gut was telling me there was something up. The guys were nice enough to me, but I just felt their behaviour was quite odd. So I say to her, look, much she looking to get, because she makes people the big, they've got a limit, they're like, I'm out to get a tenner or whatever. She's like, an R8 pound 50, I'm getting home. I was like, here, there's a score, take that, get yourself up the road. She's like, oh, chat, thanks and all that. And then uh, she's got up and she's pure, she's kind of staggering a bit, I think there was some up with her leg. And uh, she had all these messages. And I was like, she's like, she stayed in the corner, I was like, oh, right, you're not making it run in with the messages. So I'll give you a horn. And uh, she needed an R bag, and, she, and see the Lidl's a pain in the arse, you need to go on Wando and run the shop to get to the counter to get a bag, and then you need to wait in the queue. I was like, you know what, I just took all my stuff out, I was like, here, use my bag. So I've given it, I walked her in, and then uh, she's like, I'm going to get fags for the shop, cigarettes for my American audience, the one percent is. So she's went in the shop, right, and I'm walking in, she was in the shop about a half an hour, this is a corner shop, right, and it's tiny, right. I'm like, she's been caught shoplifting or something in there, man. She's came out and she's like, ah, guy's an arrogant bastard, man. We didn't even sell his thing. She's back at her bit, you would get a 10 deck for the four quid or something, and this guy wouldn't sell it. And I'm like, ah, no surprise. So she's went away raging. She's not went away raging, she just came out like that, but she's pure grateful to me. I took her to the door. And obviously, it's a woman's refuge, so I've had to leave her at the door. She's like, thanks so much, you know, and I was like, no worries. And then I went away. After I was kind of like, did she just scam me? Did I just get heavy done there? And then I was like, you know what? What what was that? Forty quid. I would lose forty quid and forget about it. But I've essentially paid forty quid to get a woman off the street into her house with enough money to get her gas and lecky, enough to food for her to get her through the night or whatever. And I and out the cold because it's freezing. And obviously, the two guys might have been the nicest people in the world. Or maybe they weren't. We didn't get to find out, thankfully. So, with that, the reason I don't really like telling that story publicly because, and I've no, because this isn't one of these mad. <sighs> what? Look at me helping the homeless. Help the homeless campaign. They're sticking. I hate people with that. Stick your phones in faces. Like it's all about you. This isn't about me. Only reason why I'm telling that is because. Like when I'm when I've got this money, it's like I feel a bit better about buying myself stuff and having money because I'm also using it for good. See that, see the feeling of doing that and helping somebody. That's forty quid to get somebody off the street. It's not. I mean, it's cheap. It's great. Know what I mean? And uh, and certainly, like last night I went to get a munch for smoky smoky trotters. I was coming out and I asked, he's like, ah, excuse me, get any spare change? I think she was love for something to eat or that. And I was like, I looked in my wallet and I was a five, and I was like, there's a five and I cut change. Like, oh, thanks so much. And I was part of me, he's like, ah, right. I was thinking after it, well, but, but was she actually getting a munch with that? And I'm like, ah, look, if you're, 
regardless whether you're looking to get a munch, a booze, drugs, whatever, if you're having to stop strangers in the street and ask them for money, you clearly do need it. You're no stop men in the street to ask for money if you've got enough money to get what you're looking for. So, I'm not trying to sit here like I'm some Padre Pio or something like that and be like, oh, look at me, I give people money. But it's like, it's a small price to pay. It's not even a price to pay, it's just being able to give is what I'm realising, is giving is better than receiving, not to sound <laughs> a bit too iffy with some sexualised terms there. If you thought that was weird, then that's on you, I'm afraid. So the reason why I got onto that subject, right, because I'm realising what I kind of want to do is use where I'm at in life with my platform, with my skill set. What I use it is try and help, help my community, help young people. So actually, I had a conversation with somebody earlier about this. Mm -hmm. uh, this woman, Ashley, she runs City Records. But con it was a, one of the conversations like, ah, ah, this has came at the right time. Mm -hmm. I believe in the law of attraction, manifesting, all that kind of stuff. So, I we had a conversation about how she's what help like, young offenders and that kind of stuff. Don't want to go into too much into the details, so I don't know how much she's like, made publicly known, but I feel as if it's moving the right track. And been able to, as I say, it's like Ravy, he's doing an amazing thing with his wrestling skills, like gain Wayne's a purpose, gain them something where they can become a character, where they can explore their own personality and get confident, man. It's like, you're literally shaping the, the future for people. It's like, and been able to do that, it's, it's a magical thing. Like, I'm looking at because I always in my head, I'm like, right, right off, get the big hoos, I'm going to move to like Newton Mearns or... The West End, as much as I slag the West End, I've, I've always wanted to move there. Don't know why it is, I think it's just that way, it's like a big nice house in the West End and all that. But same thing as well, I look at Govan and I'm like, there's a lot I could give you this community, I could contribute to this community. Because if you know Govan, you know what I mean, it's, it's the community's space is lacking at times, and you know, saying the community is lacking. In terms of, like, you've got Sonny Govan, you've got the people working the, the board that govern fair enough. There's a lot of people that are active, but it's, like, it's just... They're fighting a hard battle at times. I'd like to be a part of that and just help. Just help people, man, if it's in the position like me, because at the end of the day... The drug game's always going to be there. Gang fighting... I think it still exists in certain pockets. It wasn't to the degree of when I was younger, but I think it's still there. There's still people hanging about in gangs, whether they're partaking in gang violence, whether it's organised or not, it still happens. So, there's a lot of people that were just like me, they just don't know what to do. They don't know what pocket to fit themselves into. And, uh, aye, but I'm still trying to navigate and figure that out. You know I mean? I'm still trying to figure out, but how could I contribute? Maybe... I can show people how to set up a podcast. Huh? No, I mean, I know all the ways how not to do it. No, I'm talking about maybe. What if I was to get scheme boys in a podcast? Just make that a segment where I just set up premeditated pattern. You've got two people for the scheme just chatting to each other. Or two people for the young team. Imagine that, like two, I hate the, the term, but for people to better understand, two Neds just talking to each other, seeing what's happening, what they're up to. Would people watch that? Would that be a good thing for people today? Maybe. Host a podcast and interview me. Mm. Same thing as well. It's like, I'm trying to figure out, right, how could I make it work? But at the same time as well, because as much as I want to help, I want to make my content a separate entity because I've got my own goals, my own ambitions that they ha include what I want to do in the podcast game and the acting game, music and all that kind of stuff. As much as I've been getting slated for my music, it's been the best thing ever that happened to me and I knew it. If you go on my social media, the past two singles I've released, I've been hounded, I've been hated, and it's, honest to God, it's in a, a different level to anything I've ever experienced before in my life, right? But it's been liberating, because see, songwriting is such, it's, it's an exploration of creativity. That's where I first found it, like, like, I could really channel my creativity, that was the first love for me, and it still always is, see, right? And I just get a feeling like it, I don't get anywhere else. But what I would do, see, when people started hearing the tune, some people say, oh, they're decent in that. I would start thinking about the audience. Blah. And I could never get a tune gone after that because I'd start playing the guitar and I'd be like, oh, that's a nice wee melody. Oh, it's a wee tune. I'll start writing something. Then I'd be like, ah, right. 
how can I make this sound better? How can I make this sound so people like it? Or what, how does it sound relevant and all that? And it would just destroy any creative process that I had gone for the tune. See, you getting absolutely slated for the past two singles. It's allowing me to cast that aside because I'm like, nobody's listening to it anyway. Regardless of whether I put it out or no, nobody's listening. So, right, like, nobody's listening. And last week I wrote a wee tune, well, I've not finished it, but I've kind of uh, cast it out. And uh, that way it was just that wee bit in my head was trying to take me away. I was like, no, nobody's hearing it anyway. It doesn't matter how I write it. So it's for me, and it was beautiful. And uh, it was really, it was, uh, it was freeing. But as I say, you might watch me, and I, I don't care what people think, but there's still a part of me that is still ingrained. It's a thing I work on. And we look at the likes of bravery. You know what I mean? Like, true bravery is acting in the face of fear. I mean, the difference between the hero and the coward, there's no the emotions they feel, it's the actions they take. Because they're both scared. The hero proceeds towards the fear, whereas the coward retreats. And I just use that as an analogy. Don't think for a second if you've ever backed down for a challenge or whatever else I'm calling you a coward. Just understand what I'm trying to say here. But I've been going on hard at it for about a good hour. Ooh, I think I've had a lot of pent up podcasting in my mouth. I know I say this all the time, but after I have a wee hiatus of a couple of weeks, and then I go, oh, what's been happening? This has been happening. Oh, guess what? Back better than ever. And it, I really hope it is. I've only really got myself to thank for that. Thank for that. I've really got myself to answer to. Don't get me wrong, life does get in the way at times. But uh, same time as well, I just don't want to be releasing stuff for the sake of it. I like to at least offer some decent, rewarding content. I would say I've done that tonight. But my head was telling me not to do this. I nah, just go and chill. Go and have a big packet of Chris and watch the telly. What am I going to get out of that? What will I get out of watching the telly? What will I get out of this? I've got a lot of this. I hope you have tea, man. But as it stands, maybe call it a night there. I feel as if I could keep chatting, but where am I going with it? Feels as if I've got my point across. And uh, if you're watching, I hope it uh, get received well. Love a good receiver, don't I? <laughs> but aye, listen, I want you to interact. If you're watching this and you've got some suggestions on what kind of content I can do, what kind of stuff I can talk about, who I can talk to, they don't need to be famous. Listen, if you know your wee pal Jimmy, that's very scheme and he's got a bit of a story, I'm not just going to talk to anybody, see if I think I can have a good conversation with him. That is the, that is a passing mark, right? You can have a good conversation. So, I'll leave that there. You can meditate on it. But in the meantime, stay safe, peeps. Like, subscribe, and don't get wide. Catches!